we are looking at some of the great prayers in the Bible. And if you've ever been hurt by anyone, if your heart has ever been wounded, if you've ever been tempted to hold something against someone and to, to just cling on to that anger, you need to listen to today's message. We're going to get into some of those prayers that deal with those issues where you've been hurt, when you have been wronged, and I believe it is going to be a blessing to you. I want to look at three prayers tonight, and uh, I'm going to quote to you one that was prayed by Jesus, and then one that was prayed by Stephen, and then one that was prayed by the Apostle Paul. They'll be up on the screen. You can just listen to them. But the first one was prayed by Jesus as he was on the cross. In Luke 23 and verse 34, it said, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. The second prayer is in Acts chapter 7 and verse 60. It was prayed by Stephen as he was being martyred for his faith in Christ. And it says, Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he'd said this, he fell asleep. The third prayer, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Paul writing, he said, At my first offense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. All three prayers, very, very similar. And I believe... We can consider them three of the great prayers of the Bible, and we're going to take them one at a time in the opposite order that we just read them. As Paul is writing to Timothy, and Paul is writing as an old man. In fact, earlier in the same chapter, he said, Hey, I've finished my race, fought a good fight, kept the faith. My life's ready to be poured out like a drink offering. And Paul realized that he was coming to the end of his life. He's writing as Paul the aged here. And as he's relating some things to his son in the faith, Timothy, in verse 16, he said, At my first offense, when I first stood before Rome to give a defense for my own life, he said, No one stood with me. Everyone forsook me. It means they abandoned me. They deserted me. May it not be charged against them. And obviously he's saying, may, not, may God not charge it against them. May God not count it against them. And this was not Paul just expressing some wishful thought, but it's the reiteration of a prayer that his heart had uttered to God. When he stood before the Roman authorities to give a defense for his life, no one stood with him. Everyone deserted him. He was forsaken. And Paul is speaking here about Christians, some that he had risked his own life and suffered greatly to bring the truth of the gospel to them. Others that were fellow laborers in the gospel with him. They abandoned him in his hour of need. I'd like you to mark this place. We may come back here. We may not. And look with me in Acts 24. This is just one instance, and there's some argument about what specifically, what uh, imprisonment Paul was, was talking about. But we find one certainly here, and it was when he was, he's gone up to Jerusalem by the urging of the Spirit. And while he's there, James, who's the head of the church, says, listen, there's a lot of the, you know, the, the Jewish believers here, they're saying that 
that uh, you, you don't uh, you know, believe in the law of Moses anymore and that you're against the faith of our fathers. Listen, here, you, there's a couple of our brethren, they've taken a vow. You need to shave your head and do the vow with them and go into the temple so that they know that you're not disruptive and you're not against the Jewish religion. And Paul says, okay, I'll do what you say. And, and, and he goes and he does all that while he's in the temple. Uh, an uproar happens and they grab him and they just about pull him to pieces. People are shouting different things and, and accusing him of different things. And he eventually is taken to Caesarea. It's a coastal town about 50 miles distant from Jerusalem because word came to the Roman officer that there was a plot to assassinate Paul by the Jews. In fact, a number of the Jews had... Um, you know, sworn an oath that they wouldn't eat anything or drink anything till they'd killed Paul. And so he sends him with a whole bunch of Roman soldiers to Caesarea. And Paul is held there, and Felix is the governor at this time, and the Jews come and they, they make their, you know, argument against Paul. None of it can be substantiated. All of it is, is false, and Paul gives a defense for himself, and Felix realizes, hey, this guy hasn't done anything wrong at all. But in order to placate the Jews, Felix keeps Paul as a prisoner there. And I just want you to look at me, with me at a couple of verses in Acts 24 and verse 26. This is talking about the governor Felix. He said, meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul, that he might release him. Therefore he sent for him more often and conversed with him. But after two years, Porcius Festus succeeded Felix. Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. Paul was there under arrest, wrongly accused in Caesarea for two years. Felix the governor knew that Paul was well connected with many, many people in Jerusalem. He knew that funds could be raised to post bail. Felix was hoping to get bail money so that he could release Paul. Paul is there for two years, and not one person comes from the Jerusalem church to testify or witness in his behalf. Not a single offering is taken to raise money to post his bail so that he can be released. It's only a two-day journey. It's only 50 miles. Where is everyone? Paul said at my first defense, no one stood with me. Everyone forsook me. Now we didn't read it, but the next verse there in 2 Timothy, he said, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Friend, when everyone else abandons you, Jesus won't abandon you, and he is enough. He's all you need. But Paul said, may, it, may God not, you know, count it against them. May it not be laid against them. May it not be charged against them. Two years, and no one came. I spoke with a lady, and she's actually symptomatic of a number of conversations that I've had throughout the years. I could cite a lot of people that I've had this very conversation with, but a particular lady I was talking to her, and she was very upset at her former church and just went on and on about how terrible they were and how they had failed her and failed her husband in their time of need, and she was very, very bitter. And at that time, she and her husband weren't in church and hadn't been in church in a long time. So they were between churches, but way between churches. And she went on to share the story. Her husband had gotten ill, and no one came to visit him. No one came to the hospital. Nobody called. But I do know they attended a very large church. And I asked, and they weren't involved in any smaller circle of believers. They weren't involved in a cell group or a life group or anything like that, and weren't volunteering anywhere. They just attended. And so somehow in the largeness of the church, maybe somebody thought, okay, they're just coming to one of the many services. Maybe they're not in the same service we're in. Maybe they're not sitting in the same place. But somehow they got overlooked. Or I had a failure. Sometimes things happen. But she, she was just so angry. They failed us. And she took this brush of what she perceived as the failure of her church, 
you know, to visit her husband when he was in the hospital, and she sort of painted the whole body of Christ with his brush, and she's just bitter. Christians, you know, they say they're just a bunch of hypocrites. Everyone in the church is just a hypocrite. Well, friend, that is not so. But I know perhaps there's some people here that have been failed in one way or another, and the, the fellow believers that you trusted in, you know, didn't, you know, go to bat for you or whatever didn't happen. You know, Paul, he said, in my first defense, I mean, there, there was, if, if he's talking about when he was in Rome, there were lots of believers in Rome. To think of all the people that he risked his life for. Think of the brethren there that, you know, in Jerusalem, nobody came. But there's not the slightest hint of sour grapes with Paul. All we find coming out of his mouth is forgiveness. May God not lay it to their charge. May God not hold it against them. I don't hold it against them, and I don't want God to hold it against them. Would you look with me, if you would, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We will come back to the book of Acts, however. But 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And verse 10. Now to whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. If we don't forgive, Satan gets an advantage in our life. I, for one, don't want the devil to have any advantage in my life. How about you? But you don't know what they, they failed to do for me. No, I don't. You ought to be praying, God, don't let the sin to their charge. I forgive them, and God, I pray that you'd forgive them and you wouldn't hold it against them. But they weren't there for me. Well, they weren't there for the Apostle Paul either. But you don't want to give the devil an advantage in your life. You know, the Scripture says this in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, and I'm quoting from the Living Bible. If you are angry, don't sin by nursing your grudge. Don't let the sun go down with you still angry. Get over it quickly. For when you're angry, you give a mighty foothold to the devil. Friend, unforgiveness and bitterness will give the devil access to your life like no other thing. In fact, you look at the number one thing Jesus cited for unanswered prayer, unforgiveness. If my prayers were not getting answered, it would be the first place I would look. Do I have a grudge? Have, have I harbored unforgiveness? Do I have bitterness toward anyone? You know, I, got, I was talking to a friend yesterday, Wayne Alcorn. He's a pastor in Australia. And Wayne and I and a couple of other friends had gone to a place in northern Australia um, camping and fishing. It's called Weepa. And I mean, it is like way out nowhere. And uh, we got in a little boat and then went out nowhere further. And where we, we, you know, put our little tents up, there was crocodiles everywhere. I mean everywhere. We, we set a crab trap up and, and uh, in this sort of kind of a big creek down there and we'd catch crabs and cook them on the fire at night. But almost every night our crab trap got savaged by crocodiles. And uh, you couldn't wade in the water because there was crocs everywhere. And we'd be fishing on the shore, and you'd just be watching for crocodiles the whole time. And you go down to check that crab trap, and somebody else is down there watching for crocodiles because you don't want to be taken. Where you launch the boat, there's a big sign because somebody got taken there by a crocodile. So, like, don't go in the water when you launch your boat. They're everywhere. And we saw some big ones. Well, anyway, I'm talking to Wayne yesterday, and he says, Bayless, right where we were. He says, you got to check it out on the news. This guy got attacked by a crocodile. And so I checked it out on the news, and this guy was fishing like right on the shore, like where we're fishing, and, and this croc grabbed him, a 650-pound crocodile grabbed him, and grabbed both of his legs, and he grabbed onto a mangrove root. And it's, it's uh, you know, the story's interesting because he's just a good old country boy, and you can tell by the way he responds to the interview. He, he survived it, but he held onto that mangrove root for 30 minutes while that croc had a hold of his legs and is rolling and trying to pull him into the water. Now, just, just, I mean, messed him up bad. 
And after 30 minutes, somebody heard him calling out, and a friend came and actually got him out of the croc's jaws, saved his life. But you know what? When you, you, you don't forgive, you let the serpent sink his fangs into you. And he wants to drag you out and drown you spiritually. And I think there's some of you, you're hanging on to a mangrove root, and the only way to get out of the, the jaws that are trying to pull you down is to forgive. You've got to release it. You've got to forgive. This is one of the great prayers of the Bible. Paul's heart was broken, no doubt, by the abandonment of people that he loved and that he trusted. People that he thought would have been there in his hour of need that weren't there. But he prayed that God would forgive him. And then we look in Acts chapter 6. Look back there with me if you would. We are going to look at the second prayer, the prayer that Stephen prayed. But I want to get just a little background on Stephen. Acts chapter 6 and verse 5. They're choosing people to uh, serve food in the church. It says, saying, please the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. All right, that's verse 5. Drop down to verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, We've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. All right now, just realize what these guys are doing. They're setting up false witnesses, no doubt. They're, they're bribing people to tell lies against Stephen. And so he's brought before the high priest, and he can say his piece. And Stephen rehearses the history of, of the people of Israel and he concludes with these words in chapter 7 and verse 51. He says, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran at him with one accord. They cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Amazing. They had lied about him. They had coerced others to lie about him. They've gnashed on him with their teeth, whatever the heck that means. <laughs> this man whose face shone like an angel also spoke like an angel, and they wouldn't have any of it. They plug their ears and they raise their voices and begin to cry out, trying to drown out their own consciences, trying to drown out the truth, trying to drown out reason. And they ran at this man that had a heavenly glory on his face. Even though their hearts were cut with the truth, they utterly rejected it. They wouldn't listen. I remember 
reading something once about an attorney. He was very successful in a younger apprentice in the law office had explained to me, if you would, how you have been so successful. He says, well, three ways. He said, when I'm in a case, number one, I find out if there's a law that covers the case. He said, if there's a law that covers it, I present the law in court and I win 100% of those cases. That's a slam dunk. He said, if I can't find a specific law, you know, that covers, um, you know, my, my client, he says, I, I just gather the facts and I present the facts. He says, I win most of those cases. And the young apprentice says, well, if you, if you don't have a law, if you don't have any facts, what do you do? He says, well, that's the third thing. I beat the table with my fist and I make it a lot of noise. <laughs> You'll find out when people are in an argument, generally the one that raises their voice to the highest pitch has the less to substantiate their position. And these guys have screamed out and cried because they know what he's saying is true. And you know, says Stephen, was full of the Holy Spirit when he died. It's interesting, when he was called to public service, it says he was full of the Holy Spirit. When he was called to martyrdom, he was full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will help you die right, my friend. He'll help you live right, and he'll help you die right. In fact, you know in Acts 1 and 8, when Jesus was talking to the disciples, don't leave from Jerusalem until you receive, you know, the, the, the gift from the Father. He says, you know, uh, you, you need to receive the Holy Spirit. He says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. How many of y'all know that? Receive power from the Holy Spirit to be my witnesses. Actually, the Greek, word there, the Greek word there for witness is the identical word translated martyr in the New Testament. So it's not just about being a witness for Christ and the Holy Spirit empowering us to live. It's about if need be the Holy Spirit empowering us to die. And I, for one, want to die right when my time comes. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. But wait, you think about this. Stephen's ministry has just begun. I mean, we read he did signs and wonders among the people. Miracles are happening. God is using him. If you read the chapter, he is one of the most amazing communicators in all of the New Testament. He is full of the Word. He's amazing when he speaks. He's loved by the church. He has been handpicked by the church as a man full of wisdom and full of the Spirit. His gifts have just begun to be recognized. And he's being robbed by these liars and these murderers. Think of what could have been. He's full of the Holy Spirit, but they're full of the devil. And some would have prayed, Lord, never forget what they've done to me. Throw them into hell. May the smoke of their torment rise forever and ever. <laughs> As it says in the book of Revelation, but not Stephen. He said, God, forgive him. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Do not charge them with this sin. They have just lied, bribed people to lie about him, cut his ministry and his life short refuse to hear the truth, and he's praying, God, forgive him. Wow. That's amazing. It is so important for us to learn to pray prayers of forgiveness. Um, when you don't forgive, when you hold hostility and bitterness in your heart, there's only one prisoner in that equation, and it's you. I think someone aptly said that being bitter against another person and not forgiving them is like you swallowing poison and hoping they'll die. And we can forgive because we have been forgiven. The Bible says the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And the, the scripture teaches us that we're to forgive others even as God in Christ has forgiven us. I was guilty completely from beginning to end. Jesus took my place on Calvary's cross. He, he bore my shame. He bore my, my sin. 
Forgiveness, pardon has been freely issued to me and it's changed my life. How can I hold something against another person? And that's not to, to say to, to the person that's watching me right now that you haven't been hurt. I know some things wound very deeply. Perhaps some things were done to you that never should have been done to you. Perhaps something was not done for you that, that should have been done for you. But you need to forgive. For your sake, you need to forgive. And God will help you to do it. The first step in that, though, is receiving forgiveness from God yourself. When we learn to appreciate what we have from God, it's much easier to issue that forgiveness to others. And if you've never opened your heart to the Savior and received the forgiveness that He died on the cross to provide, why don't you pray with me right now? You just say this out loud with me. Say, oh God, thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you that He died on the cross for me. Jesus, thank you for going to that cross. Thank you for taking my sin. Thank you for bearing my shame. I believe you were raised from the dead. And I ask you right now, go ahead and say it, I ask you right now, come into my heart, be my Lord, be my Savior. Friend, you have a clean slate. Heaven holds nothing against you. Now you need to pray and forgive those that have wronged you. That's the next step that you need to take and you will find an amazing liberty that will come into your life. There's a God in heaven who knows your name. He loves you very, very deeply. Don't you ever, ever forget it. God bless you. God, are you there? Can you even hear me? I've been praying and praying with no answer at all. God, why won't you answer my prayers? Am I praying wrong? Why? You know, the Bible is filled with the stories of ordinary people like you and like me that prayed extraordinary prayers. They prayed great prayers that God answers, prayers that brought healing prayers that brought deliverance, prayers that brought guidance. And I've done this series on great prayers of the Bible. We actually look at the prayers themselves and we discover some secrets and some truths that can help us pray great prayers in the circumstances and the situations of our life. I know it will be a blessing to you. Great prayers of the Bible. Bayless Conley shares prayers that get results in his message series, Great Prayers of the Bible. Request your CD or DVD copy today when you call the number on your screen or visit AnswersBC.org. God is there. He can hear you, and He wants to answer your prayers. Request your copy of Great Prayers of the Bible today.